It's now my very great pleasure to introduce a woman who epitomises the word courage. At 10.25 on a Saturday night in 2012, Kathy Kelly received a phone call that every parent dreads. Four years later, the tragedy was compounded even further. The preventable death of Kathy's two sons left her determined to make a difference. Through advocacy, prevention and education, she started a movement that would bring changes to the New South Wales judicial system and new liquor licensing legislation. Her focus now is on developing leading programs to reduce teenage suicide. For Cathy, the key was turning her grief into determination to create change. She didn't give in to it. She moved forward. Please make Cathy very welcome. Good evening, First Lady Lucy Turnbull, New South Wales Premier Mike Baird, New South Wales Police Commissioner Andrew Scipioni, New South Wales Attorney General Gabrielle Upton, Lord Mayor of Sydney Clover Moore, ladies and gentlemen, friends and family. My name is Stuart Kelly. I'm Thomas's younger brother. I was 14 years old when Tom was brutally attacked without reason, resulting in him losing his life. Tom was out with his friends. It was his first night out in Sydney. We were at home in Barrel, doing what many families do on a Saturday night, watching TV and getting ready for bed. The phone rang at 10.25pm. 10 Mum answered it, but couldn't comprehend what the person was telling her, so she passed the phone to Dad. The voice on the end of the phone told him that they needed to come to St Business Hospital urgently. Mum and Dad told my sister, Madeline and I, that Tom had been in an altercation. They had to drive up to Sydney to be with him, but probably would be back later during the night. We had absolutely no idea of the extent of Tom's injuries. The person from the hospital would not give any further information, except to firmly ask that we come straight to the hospital. Maddie and I stayed at home. It was really late, so we went to bed. On Sunday morning, Mum's sister Carrie called, telling us she was driving down to Barrow from Sydney to pick us both up. I felt really uneasy. I couldn't understand why Carrie would be coming and not our parents. Waiting at home, I thought about what might what might have happened to Tom. Never did I think or imagine that we might lose our brother. I remember walking into the foyer of St Vincent's Hospital around midday on that Sunday. The foyer was bustling with people. As we made our way to the lifts, I was trying to work out what was going on while we were there. Madeline had even brought up her school books with her to study as she was stressed about her upcoming HSC trial examinations. We took the lift to the fourth floor where mum and dad met us. They took us into a small room, closing, it, closing the door. I could tell by the look on their faces that something serious had happened. I thought this was really strange as we were not visiting Tom. Nothing was making any sense to me. Finally, Dad said to us, Thomas has been badly hurt. The doctors want to explain it to the both of you. I felt uneasy. We waited for what seemed to be a very long time, but probably wasn't. Two doctors came in with a social worker. We all sat down. I was feeling scared and anxious, and I was about to find out why. Your brother Thomas is in a critical condition and will not survive. I was being told to prepare for his death. Those few words would change our lives forever. I don't remember too much more of what they said. I was in shock and total disbelief. I heard those terrible words, but was feeling that this could not be real. This could not be happening to Tom. I could not process this as our reality. I look back at that moment, I was 14 years old. I was told by a stranger that my brother, my best friend, was going to die. I'm now 17. That was three years ago. However, I carry a deep scar that you cannot see. It's always there. It never leaves. It sits below the surface of your skin and surfaces when you least expect it. The last time that I'd seen Tom alive was at a Wallabies game against Wales on the 23rd of June. We had so much fun. Lots of banter between the two of us, laughing at the Welsh accents, trying to imitate them. It was a great afternoon, but now it is a memory caught in time, a memory of my final time with Tom. It is a memory that we should have continued to be joined by many more as we continued to grow up and grow old together. Thomas never deserved to die that night. It was not meant to be his time. In fact, I believe now that it could and should have been avoided. Our family lost a son and a brother. I ask all of you to look at me. I am but one person who has been affected by violence. 
It's a sentence that I have to carry for the rest of my life. My mother, father and sister now carry this sentence. Our relatives and friends, Tom's friends, carry this sentence. We are not alone. There are many, many thousands of others who are directly affected by senseless violence every year. Today, I'm preparing to complete Year 12 at the King's School with my HSC only weeks away. My graduation is this Friday. I still remember sitting in Futter Hall with my parents and Madeline watching Tom graduate. Now it's my turn. How will I feel with the he when the headmaster shakes my hand? I want to ask all of you in this room right now to think of your children or the children of someone special that you may know. Would you want them to be here on this stage right now, making this speech? It's time for change. Action is needed through strong leadership from the New South Wales State Government and the Federal Government. Action is needed by our friends and our families across all of our communities. Change to stop the growing epidemic of drug and alcohol abuse and misuse and to say no to senseless violence. Premier, will you make this promise tonight? Australia is an alcoholic. We need to rethink we, the way we drink. Tonight, your involvement and your voice can and will make a difference. To finish, I would like to read a short poem that my father read at Thomas's funeral. It's a stark, blunt message to, it, to us all. It's titled, The Guy in the Glass. When you get all you want and you struggle for pelf and the world makes you king for a day, then go to the mirror and look at yourself and see what the man has to say. For it isn't your mother, your father or wife whose judgment upon you must pass, but the man whose verdict counts most in your life is the one standing back from the glass. He's a fellow to please, never mind all the rest, for he's with you right to the end. And you've passed your most difficult test if the man in the glass is your friend. You may be like Jack Horner and chisel a plum and think you're a wonderful guy, but the man in the glass says you're only a bum if you can't look him straight in the eye. You can fool the whole world down the highway of years and take pats on the back as you pass, but your final reward will be heartache and tears if you've cheated the man in the glass. Thank you. Put that round of applause going for Stuart Kelly, everybody. I'm Thomas and Stuart Kelly's mum and I'd like to thank Cathy firstly for her lovely introduction but I must say uh, my husband and Ralph is here with us today and um, all of those lovely things she said about me were really about him. He was the one that fought through his grief to start um, what we have and are doing today and um, I've just been there supporting him along the way and um, speaking where I can and sharing our story so that um, we can try and make a difference. Our eldest son Thomas stepped out of a taxi on his very first night out in Sydney in 2012. He was holding a pretty girl's hand on his way to a friend's 18th birthday party. Within a couple of minutes another 18 year old man stepped away from a darkened wall that he was leaning against, only a few metres um, in front of Tom. Without any confrontation or any words spoken, he strode over and hit Thomas in the face, <coughs> resulting him cracking his skull on the pavement. And Tom's life was literally taken from us at that very moment. And that beautiful man that you just heard speaking is our youngest son, Stuart. I hadn't heard his speech until he delivered it that night at our foundation's fundraising dinner in September 2015. It was a speech that made its way into the media, media nation, nationwide and it was a powerful speech, a powerful message to communities and our governments. It was heartbreaking to finally hear Stuart's underlying pain of losing his brother. He left myself, our family, and friends and an audience of over 750 guests in tears. 
And speaking out like this was really unnatural for Stuart. He didn't enjoy any of those presentations you do in English at school. So this was really quite an accomplishment for a 17-year-old. As I said, I'd like to share our journey with you now in the hope that you can take away something to do to bring about change. I think alone our voice may not be loud enough, but together we can really be a force to be reckoned with. Madeline and Stuart didn't like to talk about Tom and they would pretend he was away on a gap year and busy themselves with their studies, their sport and their friends. <coughs> 22 months ago, Stuart took his life. Now Madeline doesn't talk about Tom or Stu. The ripple effect that Thomas's murder in 2012 has had on our family has all but destroyed us. To this day, we're still in disbelief. Not for one moment did we believe that Stuart's life would come to this. Losing both our boys at the same age of 18 and a half is just incomprehensible. I'm not going to pretend that everything's okay because it isn't. Uh, but when Thomas was murdered, I often thought, why him? I was just 51 years old at the time and I thought, I have had a fortunate life. I've been in love, I'm married, I had three beautiful children and surely it should have been me instead of Tom, whose adult life, the one he would take responsibility for, had only just begun. But now having lost both Tom and Stu, there are many, many days that I just don't want to be here. Why have we had to endure such immense loss, not just once, but twice? But Ralph and I still have our gorgeous 22-year-old daughter, Madeline, and I have to say that uh, we try to stay strong for her and live our lives, not just for her, but for the memory and love of her brothers and our sons. As the weeks passed when we lost Thomas, we started to reach out to people to try and understand how this could happen to him. We met as many people as we could and no one seemed to want to turn us away. One of the first meetings that Ralph had was with the previous New South Wales Police Commissioner, Andrew Scipioni, who told him that we have the third largest police force in the Western world with an annual budget of $3.4 billion and 70% of their resources were tied up with violence. He said, we cannot arrest our way out of this. We need the community to step up and demand change. This and in many other meetings, particularly those with the Department of Public Prosecution, saw our gr grief turn from anger and then into determination. This was the beginning of our fight for advocacy, for change and preventative programs. When we looked at the harms of alcohol in our health, we discovered it causes cancer, obesity and depression amongst many other things. And alcohol related cancers result in more deaths than does melanoma. And drinking excess amounts, excessive amounts of alcohol also increases the risk of breast cancer. In addition to this, we also see alcohol being responsible for violence and accidents. How many times do we hear about our youth falling off balconies when they go away to schoolies? These are just a couple of the statistics. If you look at it, victims of domestic violence, there's 24,000. 20,000 victims of child abuse, 175,000 hospitalisations, and 5,500 deaths, which equates to 15 deaths per day and 95% of Australian households are affected by alcohol. And the cost nationally is $15 billion. So I think, as Stuart said, it's time we rethink the way that we drink. So in September 2013, we launched the Thomas Kelly Youth Foundation as a legacy to our son, Thomas. At its heart, the Foundation's prime purpose is to ensure all of our youth are safe. We're not about not drinking, but educating people around responsible drinking, the harms of excessive amounts of alcohol, and the cost on our society. 
So poor decisions could result in any one of us becoming an offender or a victim. And our children need to think about the consequences of their actions. And as parents and mentors to these children, we need to be motivated, active role models. Our foundation has a number of youth ambassadors um, working with the foundation. Two of them are incredible young people who are giving back to their communities. Chris Lee, the boy in the centre there, he um, was also a victim of violence in King's Cross. Chris co-founds uh, co-founded an educational group in New South Wales called the Conviction Group. And Chris and his team run an annual workshop across Sydney to male students from Year 10. And they discuss all issues that relate to young men's health, uh, from you know, steroids in their body image to violence, alcohol, and all the things that they might be starting to become a part of in their lives. So it's a fantastic program, which is always has a very broad and down-to-earth group of speakers. Rebecca Stokes, um, the lady with the singlet on there, she was attacked while out with some friends at a pub in Queensland. She's been through years of rehabilitation and has been un unable to return to work full time. She does run an annual fundraising event through her gym, the CrossFit gym, and uh, she supports our foundation uh, enormously. Uh, the event she has is called Lifting Above Violence, and last year the Brisbane Broncos and the Gold Coast Titans took part in this wonderful event, reaching out to the community to rid violence from their everyday lives. Another young life that was lost closer to here in Victoria was that of David Cassai, and I'm not sure if you all remember, but he was killed in Rye on New Year's Eve, the very same year as Thomas, to a one-punch attack. We've come to know David's mother, Katerina Politi, um, quite well, and uh, she has been a very active member of your community, working with governments to bring about change. These tragedies bring us together, beautiful, sad, and wonderful people. One moment that connected us forever, but one that I guess all of us wish we had never um, experienced. Thomas was known as TK amongst his friends at school. And whilst we were on a family holiday one year, um, he made his initials in the sand that you can see there on the left. And Maddie, his sister, put uh, Tom's thongs next to that, uh, to that little sand pile and took a photo of them. Our message is gaining momentum through our brand, Take Care, and we spell care with a K, taking on his initials. So who would have thought that this innocent photograph would become our platform to create change. Just some of the milestones that the foundation um, has, has, um, has made, um, some of the areas that we have advocated for has been a result of the injustice that we found during the few years that we went through the New South Wales courts. We've made amendments to the Sentencing Act as a result of Thomas's case, um, and these really are in three key areas. The One Punch Law, um, which I know you have a similar law in, in Victoria, has our youth now speaking about this. And although it is similar to manslaughter, they understand now that if someone dies as a result of their actions, that there is a minimum in New South Wales uh, sentence of eight years with a maximum of 25. So that's really um, very important that our young people are starting to talk about this because I guess it, it gives them you know, the ultimatum that I, you know, I will spend time in prison if I'm responsible. Uh, victim impact statements um, are now able to be taken into account when sentencing. When we were uh, going through the Supreme Court in New South Wales, the Offenders Defence Council was permitted to submit as many character references as they wished, which were then considered by the judge when he passed sentence. And victim impact statements were not allowed to be considered. But today, family victim impact statements can also be taken into account, which provides somewhat um, of a fairer justice system for the victims. Non-domestic um, violence assaults when under the influence of alcohol will no longer be seen as an excuse. So in Thomas's sentencing, we were shocked to hear that um, we were told that the offender was intoxicated and that it was a mitigating factor, so an excuse and that if he were not under the influence of alcohol at the time, he probably wouldn't have done it. Um, we met with the Attorney-General who agreed to move non-domestic assaults to neutral 
unfortunately not an aggravating factor, which is where it really should be. And domestic violence has been left as a mitigating factor, so alcohol is an excuse. How can we expect to see cultural change if people are not accountable for their actions? Uh, we also um, began a financial hardship program. After we left, lost Thomas, Ralph um, found that he couldn't work. Um, he had his own business, which was um, being greatly affected by the fact that he just could not con concentrate. And we found ourselves financially stretched as the bills kept coming in. And he put all his efforts into creating change by focusing on the foundation, working seven days a week. After two to three years going through the New South Wales courts, we were almost bankrupt. We met several other families and we subconsciously realised that every one of them were in a similar position. A loss is so, that is so great affects you not only emotionally, physically and mentally, but it can ruin you and usually does ruin you financially. So we knew that something more could be done to support victims who were going through these dreadful situations. We met with the New South Wales Attorney General and we put forward our suggestions on how we could help victims financially. In March 2016, the financial hardship package was introduced with over 5,000 families being assisted um, since its implementation. So the victims are allocated a person um, to provide them with support to assist them wherever there is a debt, setting up payment plans or a grace period until the family gets back on their feet. And, you know, that is so important. It may not seem so, but, you know, when you're in that position where you have to ring your local council for the third time because, you know, you can't pay your water rates or whatever and they, they say, you know, I'm kind of sick of hearing from you. And as in Ralph's case, he approached the, um, the ATO because he had, quite, had built up quite a large tax debt and the person on the other end of the phone said, I don't care if your son's been murdered, you've got to pay your taxes. So this sort of program really will, you know, help people enormously, which is, um, we're very proud of that. Um, and finally there, there was the introduction of the Take Care Safe Space program, which I'll discuss further in a moment. Additionally, we've um, implemented um, 11 CCTV cameras in the city and King's Cross. We've been instrumental in media awareness campaigns to reduce violence in our society. And changes to liquor legislation in New South Wales from February 2014, with the introduction of a number of laws around licensing, has made a significant impact on reducing violence. We've also partnered with three universities now. Um, the University of New South Wales, who are evaluating the success of the Safe Space program. Um, we are, have recently partnered with UTS, who are developing further programs for the foundation. And um, most recently, Ralph has been involved with another university in, in Western Sydney. Um, we're looking at um, a number of their paramedics coming out as part of their training to assist um, on the safe space. And of course, we've um, done some work with programs for schools, community groups and corporate education. Now, the Take Care uh, Safe Space um, began in December 2014 and we commenced the first space um, in Sydney near the Town Hall. Our Take Care Ambassadors um, are predominantly vol volunteers and they work through the night, every Friday and Saturday night, help, helping get our youth home safely. They hand out water, thongs to young women who can't walk in their high heels anymore, who you see wandering along the streets in bare feet, which is not very safe. Um, they help with directions and transport and provide a place to sober up and even charge their mobile phones. Sometimes they have saved someone from sexual assault and in some cases there have been um, the saving of lives. We currently operate in three spaces next to the town hall, as I mentioned, Darling Harbour and King's Cross. And at some point it just would be amazing to see this program uh, running nationally. In just over three years, the Safe Space program has helped 60,000 young people. We call them sliding door moments. It's the difference in whether these kids get home safely or not. And countless sons and daughters have been spared from becoming victims of violent assaults, theft, and <coughs> assaults like the one that took Thomas's life. 
BOSCA, which is the Bureau of Crimes and Statistics <coughs> Research, um, released the following figures a while ago now, but I think they're, they're fairly similar. And the reduction of the mo monthly non-domestic violence um, in King's Cross since January 2014 has been reduced by 45% and in the CBD, 20% and midweek reductions are as high as 93 or nearly 94 per cent, um, and uh, uh, in the CBD of 40, 57 per cent. So with the changes to legislation from early 2014, the implementation of the Safe Space Program and the introduction of the Sydney lockout laws, there has not been a single death at Sydney's busy, busiest emergency department at St Vincent's Hospital um, due to any to a serious brain injury admission. When Thomas was killed in 2012, there were neurosurgeons on standby every single weekend and facial reconstruction surgeons coming in on Monday. And of course, this was stopping, you know, ongoing surgeries of people that, that needed other surgeries because of, of the violence. We then questioned um, how many lives they felt had been saved at St Vincent's Hospital since those changes came into play. And Professor Gordian Fuldy, who um, has only just recently retired as the Director of Emergency at St Vincent's and was the 2016 Senior Australian of the Year, said that there would have been a minimum of 20 to 40 patients that did not present as a result um, from previous years. So then we looked at the cost of a serious brain injury and we were told that um, it was an astounding 5.4 to $12 million per patient. Now that covers the cost of surgeries, rehabilitation, hospitalisation and, uh, and as I said, um, you know, lifelong injuries. So if you take the minimum of those patients of say 20 people that didn't present um, at, and the minimum cost of $5 billion per patient, it results in a saving to the community of approximately $100 million. So, but behavioural change is, I think, is, it's definitely a long-term process and it's essential for all of our children to be able to go out and enjoy themselves and return home safely. We can't do this alone. We need everyone's help. Um, we need you to make informed and sensible, sensible decisions when out drinking. And uh, as I said, it will take many, many years, but we are starting to see the beginning of cultural change. We need people to take care of themselves and of each other. In February 2016, the New South Wales Government began the process of reviewing the results of the lockout laws in Sydney. And the New South Wales State Government introduced amendments to the liquors legislation laws in February 2014, commonly referred to the lockout laws. And these laws were brought in as a result of Thomas's death and another young 18-year-old a year later, Daniel Christie. The community had had enough of violence on our streets and as a result, our family became, uh, sorry, came under intense scrutiny by some members of the general public. Three prominent businessmen who did not support the lockout laws were behind a number of blogs and vile, untrue articles that were being written and published online and in a prominent Sydney newspaper. We were experiencing death threats. Let's kill off the rest of the Kelly dogs. What about that scum, Ralph Kelly? Look at them trying to be famous. Thomas will be rolling over in his grave. And Stuart Kelly is a political puppet. People soon forgot what we had been through. Our innocent son was murdered without any confrontation as he stepped out of a taxi and was punched in the face moments later. Two days later, we were told to turn off his life support our other children were just 14 and 17 years old. And we were then subjected to three years in court from the local to the High Court of Australia. Stuart commenced at the residential college St Paul's in February 2016, whilst all this was going on, which is located on the grounds of the University of Sydney. Fairfax Media was investigating the false allegations and they put Stuart's speech that you just saw today online. And it was the very day that Stuart started orientation week at the university. Unfortunately, even though Fairfax were trying to help, our darling Stuart 
was under fire from his peers the moment he stepped onto the grounds of the college. 18 to 25 year olds are the main segment affected by the lockout laws. They are angry, they feel that their rights to drink 24 hours a day have been selfishly taken away from them. The very laws designed to protect them would eventuate in Stuart taking his life. Stuart called us 12 hours after we, had left, after we had left him in his new residence. We missed his first few calls. But later that afternoon he rang again and asked us to come and collect him from outside Royal Prince Alfred's medical centre. Immediately I was worried and I asked if he was okay, but he said, just come and get me. We arrived to find him sitting in the gutter with his head in his hands. He got in our car and he sobbed uncontrollably. I hadn't seen him cry like that since Thomas's life support was switched off. We drove home as we knew we had to get him somewhere that he felt safe. We tried and tried over the next few weeks to ask him what had happened. However, to this day, we still don't know. Even though we know it was suicide, the coroner is still investigating the case. What happened to our son that night that would take him away from his dream at the King's School to go to Sydney University and, and live at St Paul's College and see him retreat to his room for the next two to three months? We believe something catastro catastrophic happened to Stuart that night and although we may never get an answer, I'm sure we will both dry, die trying to find out. Stuart had never shown a day of depression in his life. I know that he must have been suffering silently with the loss of his brother, his best friend, but he had the most extraordinary life at the King's School. He was there for six years as a boarder um, and in his final year, he was at the head of his boarding house, the largest in the school. He was selected as a school prefect, one of 25 out of a cohort of 225 boys, and he had loads of friends. He was a leader, and he innocently took a stance against violence at that dinner when he was old enough to make that choice. He called me from school after the Crown Appeal was heard in Supreme Court. He was only 16 at the time. And he asked if he could address the press following the re release of the findings when they were read in court. He wanted to take a stance for his brother, whom he loved and missed. He wanted kids his own age to know that things weren't okay and that they needed to band together to bring about change. I have nothing but absolute admiration for that and there was certainly no puppetry involved. Stuart only ever spoke for himself. This slide um, shows the, the latest statistics of Australian suicide. It's absolutely appalling that we lose three and a half thousand loved ones every single year, which equates to eight deaths a day and an attempt every eight minutes. What's happening in our society that we have over 70,000 attempts of suicide nationally each year? We've learned since losing Stuart that 50% of the people who do take their lives do not seek medical intervention or speak out about their feelings. These people have events that occur in, in, that change their lives, possibly a major tragedy, a change in their cultural setting, are bullied, ridiculed, or have, or those who suffer monetary problems that seem insurmountable. Following that one night at St Paul's College, Stuart barely surfaced from his room. Of course, we were worried about him and sought advice from several people, but trying to force a young adult to seek medical advice is almost impossible. We did see a professor at Headspace uh, without Stuart, and she did advise us that we should help him find part-time work, not put too much pressure on him, and slowly encourage him to get out and reconnect with the world again. But there was never any urgency in this meeting or suggestion that he might be in a place where he would consider taking his life. He started working part-time um, in a role at uh, Royal North Shore Hospital three days a week and he was coaching a rugby team at his old school twice a week. And up until the time of his death, he was going to the gym six or seven days a week. After a while, Stuart began to talk about wanting to go overseas to London to study and restart his life. Ralph was born in the UK and the children have um, both passports. He felt that he would never be accepted here. So he applied for several places and was offered a position at a university not far from London. 
Two weeks before he took his life, Ralph and Stuart took our dog for a walk. And Stuart brought up the, the idea of going overseas again. And Ralph said, you know, if we can manage it, we wouldn't want you to go unless you had some counselling because you'd be, you know, we'd be so worried about you on the other side of the world. And he looked at Ralph and said, look at me, Dad. I go to work without complaining in my rotten job. I love training my rugby boys and I'm fit and I'm strong. Do I look like I need help? And Ralph's response was, no, you don't. But Stuart was unable to share his pain with us. At a doctor's appointment following Stuart's death, Ralph was saying to the doctor that he didn't think we'd really listen to Stuart. And the doctor told him two things that I think are really worth noting. One was that he often asks young patients a question and their parents jump in and answer for them. And I know that I've done that when I've taken my children to the doctor. And kids today, secondly, kids today don't speak about their problems with their parents because they don't want to add to the burden of their already stressful lives. So I think it's time we went back to basics. We need to, you know, at least a couple of times a week sit around the table together without our devices and talk with each other and truly listen. We need to ask them how they feel. And I think if we start doing that, um, we will see that listening does save lives. You will hear it over and over again uh, when somebody you know has taken their lives. The person will say, I didn't see it coming. And I know we certainly didn't. I recently attended a, a lunch for Lifeline and um, there was about seven or 800 guests in the room, probably similar to today. And the CEO asked everyone to raise their hand if they had been touched by suicide. So I'd like to ask you now if you uh, would please raise your hand if you have been touched by suicide in any way. Now, I'd really like you to keep your hands up and I'd like you to look around the room and see there's probably not a table or a chair in the distance there where there has not been somebody that has been touched by suicide. So this is truly an epidemic. Early last year, we were approached by the, the National Rugby League to have a day to remember Stuart. And that was held on the 23rd of July, which was almost a year to the day since uh, we lost him. And whilst this was a really wonderful and caring gesture by the NRL, we felt that the day needed to have messages that the broader community could really relate to. We wanted to raise awareness about suicide, particularly in our youth, and to encourage everyone to speak up and to listen to those around us um, that really do need our support. And one of our volunteers um, on the Safe Space came up with the concept of using Stuart's initials like we had done with Thomas with Take Care, and so we agreed on Stay Kind. Our partners for the event were the NRL, Lifeline, Channel 9, the Parramatta Eagles and the West Tigers who um, played in the game, and APN Outdoor Digital Billboards uh, gave the foundation national coverage, which was valued at over $2 million. So they're extraordinary um, in the way that they supported us. And another um, family friend uh, has an organisation called Air Star Australia, who supported us at all our events with their amazing uh, eye-catching um, branded air balloons. The day was an incredible day, with more than double the normal crowd for that time in the competition. And not only did supporters uh, of the teams come out on the day, but people from all areas of the community. And the crowd tipped over just over 30,000 people. It was wonderful to see everybody get behind the day. We had um, some of the catering staff proudly wearing our logo. And uh, our volunteers, as you can see there, um, were going around with those great balloons on their backs, um, asking people how they felt and, and wanting them to stay kind. So stay kind is a simple message. It's one we believe needs to be, we all need to be reminded of. It's about each one of us pulling together to show respect and to be kind to each other with family, work colleagues, schools, universities, everyone. We need to understand that we need to treat people equally, regardless if they are struggling in some way or seem a little different to us. As a foundation, but more so for our family, we were overwhelmed when both teams decided to change their jerseys for the day. 
Um, the West Tigers sponsor Bryden Lawyers were incredibly supportive by giving up their own logo on this occasion. And uh, you can see there that the Eels also proudly wore the stay kind on their jerseys. My husband Ralph has always been a keen supporter of the Tigers. However, as a student of the King's School, which is in the same area as the Eels in Sydney, round Parramatta, uh, Stuart was an avid Eels supporter, even though they haven't done very well in the competition for a number of years, um, but avid uh, supporter um, anyway, like his mum. It was a really exciting game that day, and in the last few minutes, the score was 16 all. And I'm not sure how or why it happened, but the Eels scored a full goal in the last few minutes, giving them the win for the first Stay Kind Cup. And uh, Stu would have been pretty happy with the result. And that was just the trophy there. So we were thrilled to have this opportunity to start this important discussion um, at this particular event to try to destigmatize the fact that people feel inferior if they are suffering in one way or another. And we've recently held our second Stay Kind um, Day match this uh, in um, Easter of this year with the same incredible brave players, and it's now an annual match for the NRL, so we're very happy with that. I think we need to really start thinking about how we can change the stigma associated with depression and what ways we can encourage those suffering to, to, in silence to try and come forward and seek help. As a community, we need to be more open about depression, bullying and suicide. If we begin to speak out about these issues as the norm, those suffering won't necessarily feel ostracised and different from all of those people around them. I just Googled this the other day and it says, on average, around one in six women and one in eight men will experience some level of depression throughout their lives. So it is affecting a very large majority of us. Stay Kind now, now stands together with Take Care, and Stuart supported the work of the Foundation and our mis mission to keep our young people safe. It's understandable that we may feel neglected or disrespected in today's society, but that's why it's so important to remember to be kind to each other and to take care of ourselves as well as those uh, uh, other people that we care for. If you're feeling overwhelmed, don't keep it to yourself. We need to change the way we, act, we react with one another. This year we began a national campaign at, our, um, at that same football match or same rugby league match and uh, we have called it hashtag stay kind conversations. There's approximately 24 million Australians in our country so if we could all show at least one kind act per day, that would equate to 8 billion 760 million acts of kindness a year. So it's a pretty big number there. Imagine how together we can change the world with kindness. We can bring it into our homes by telling our children what we did as parents that was kind that day. Simple things like letting a car in front of us, smiling more, paying a favour forward, or being positive um, around our family or at work. Then maybe go home and ask your children what they did at school that day that was kind. Just try it. There are so many ways that we can all be kind. We met at, um, at a rugby uh, league game last year uh, around Anzac Day, all of the Victoria Cross recipients. And uh, one of them, of course, was Ben Robert Smith. And he walked over to Ralph and I and asked how he could help. It turned out Ben was cyberbullied himself. And so Ben agreed to, to do a video around the message, Stay Kind. So I'd just like to play that for you now. People know me foremost for my prior role as an Australian Army soldier. My family has for several generations shared a vision of the importance of patriotism and the protection of the Australian people. Stay Kind resonates with me in relation to these values and our family beliefs of the importance of protecting our country and those who live in it. Stay Kind is about being selfless and caring for others and it is also about being kind to yourself and seeking help from others. As a country, we have a strong mateship culture, yet we have one of the highest rates of youth suicide in the world and the leading cause of death of young Australians. Something is wrong in our society for this to be happening. Stay Kind promotes important community values that seem obvious but are often forgotten. It encourages you to stay kind to others, as you can never know what someone is feeling. The Stay Kind initiative encourages the community to be more intuitive in looking after our youth. It also encourages you to look after yourself, seek support if needed, 
we do care about you. People may not know that I'm also a father of two young girls and often think about their journey ahead. Our young people face many difficult circumstances growing up today. The internet and social media has created what can be a harsh environment and with big expectations of our young people. As parents, we must adapt our parenting skills to this rapidly changing world. We need to be providing different support and care to our young people as they travel their path into adulthood. Often, young people do not have a great deal of confidence. They are grappling with how they fit in, what their place is in the world and if they are good enough. I remember from my own experiences how the cruelty of others can have such a huge impact on your psyche. Stay Kind encourages you to ask me how I feel and encourages you to really listen. A young person may not have the confidence to tell you they need help. The support that is probably one of the most critical for our youth is from loved ones, family, friends, and perhaps even teammates. However, genuine care and a show of support really only comes from genuinely listening. Listening saves lives. Please stay kind. We all face difficult, painful situations in our lives, professionally and personally. It's normal to feel negativity, to have fears that we are not good enough. Resilience is a term used to describe the psychological strength an individual has, which allows them to overcome and grow from crisis and challenging situations which cause us to suffer. Resilience is not about struggling alone. It's about the use and mobilisation of ordinary human processes, including positive emotions, trusted social support, optimism, and the use of our own authentic strengths to remain positive and successful when faced with adversity. We've been faced with two catastrophic events, and we are making positive changes with our wonderful partnerships. Resilient employees cope well with ambiguity, treat setbacks of, as improvement opportunities and develop meaningful, lasting connections with colleagues and stakeholders. Each of you here today has the power to build something positive, inspire others, and ultimately come out successful despite all the odds being stacked against you. I've spoken at a few schools and um, openly and honestly, I believe that stories teach resilience. This is a group of year 11 girls that um, I've spoken at the last couple of years for their leadership event. And many of them came along last year and supported us at the first Stay Kind Day. We've also had the privilege to meet these incredibly um, resilient people who have also suffered. And they're proudly there wearing our Stay Kind Take Care wristbands. Meeting and becoming friends with people such as the Morecams who lost their little boy Daniel, Taria Pitt from the dreadful uh, fire in Western Australia, Louisa Hope from the Sydney siege, and probably close to home, Noel, Noel Dixon from Melbourne, whose daughter, Sarah Kafferke, was brutally murdered in 2012. Meeting these wonderful people has been bittersweet. They are so incredibly inspiring and help each of us to hold each other up. I also had the pleasure of meeting Prince Harry in June last year. Um, he was at a government house meeting that we uh, were very fortunate enough to be invited along to, to meet the um, athletes who were going to compete in the Invictus Games. He graci graciously took a letter I wrote about our boys and our foundation's values-based programs. The work he's now doing with Prince William and the Duchess of Cambridge, Kate, is also value-based and the palace has handed a brief of our work directly to their organisation, Heads Together. Take care and stay kind are values based. We rarely, if ever, talk about coward punches and our focus is about changing values around being healthy and keeping our children safe. Changing the way we think for the better of others for a brighter future. Similarly, we don't talk about suicide, what goes before what goes before compassion, before resilience? That's what we talk about, and that's kindness. Currently, we believe we have a deficit of kindness in Australia. We talk about mateship, but people are so busy, and Australia believes that mateship is now waning. But without kindness being first, you cannot change people who bully, haze, or are violent. So it's time for a proactive change. My generation, 
our generation can start a movement that our children can grow up with as the norm. I'd like to share a message that we received upon Stuart's death. And this was sent to us from the King School headmaster, Dr. Timothy Hawkes, where both our boys had graduated only seven months before we lost them both. He said, Dear Ralph and Kathy, I cannot tell you how much my heart has been breaking for you over these last few days. I just don't have the words, so I will borrow from others. Ralph Waldo Emerson suggested that a successful life was to laugh often and much, to win the respect of intelligent people and the affection of children, to earn the appreciation of honest critics and endure the betrayal of false friends, to appreciate beauty, to find the best in others, to leave the world a better place, a bit better, whether by, healthy, by a healthy child, a garden patch, or redeemed social condition. To, even, to know even one life has breathed easier because you have lived, this is to have succeeded. He went on to say, Stuart succeeded. Stuart left the world a better place. He fronted cameras when his natural disposition was not to. He endured the challenge and even betrayal of those who did not support his mission of making Australia a safer place. As the coach of the under 14 seas at Kings, he won the affection of children, and among his mentors and staff, he also won the respect of intelligent people. Stuart appreciated beauty, and he could find the best in others. He had many wonderful mates. Your son has left the world in a healthier condition because of his support for measures to limit problem drinking. This has been transformative work, vital, dangerous, visionary. In every sense, Stuart succeeded, and you can be proud of him. Be assured of my thoughts and prayers with deep affection, Tim. So, our 18-year-old son, who had suffered so much, was seen by the head of his school, his mentors, his friends and family to have had such an impact on the community. So I leave you with this. Nothing should stop any one of us in this room today from showing up with intention and purpose to maximise every opportunity in our own lives. You have to get up each day and just place one foot in front of the other. And remember, if we each do our part with small acts of kindness, together as a community, we will see big impacts. So we would love for you to get involved with our foundation in any way that you can. If you're interested, please go to our website. Just look up thomaskelly.com.au. But I'd like to leave you with one last thought. If you know someone in your life who has lost a child, please don't say, how are you? You don't have to say anything. Just give them a hug. Thank you very much.